So thank you all for being here. Um, I think that everyone who's here at the summit is here because in some way they represent excellence in public health and are deeply engaged in public health. But even if you are deeply engaged in public health, it's possible that you are not aware of how profound a threat antibiotic resistance represents. For a lot of people, it's been an invisible issue. And until recently, it really hasn't been a top level issue of public policy concern. But that's changing. The Review on Antimicrobial Resistance, which is a project chartered by the British government, recently estimated that the current toll of antibiotic resistance worldwide is 750,000 deaths a year. And by the year 2050, that toll could rise to 10 million. By 2050, if we don't get resistance under control, it could cost us $100 trillion in global productivity. So if we don't avert that toll, we'll instead have to alter the conduct of medicine, the practices of agriculture, the processes of business, the flow of international trade, even the way in which families live their everyday lives. But countering that threat imposes profound challenges, and that's what these very distinguished speakers are here to talk to us about. Their bios are in the program. I'm not going to take up your time reciting them, but I do just want to briefly introduce them. So all the way to my left, your right, Dr. Beth Bell, director of the CDC's National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infections, Dr. Zachary Rubin, clinical medical director of epidemiology and infection control, UCLA, all the way over on my right, Dr. Barry Eisenstein, distinguished physician at Merck and Company, and right here from our hosts, the Milken School of Public Health, Dr. Lance Price, who's director and founder of the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center. We're going to have a very fast-moving colloquy among all these folks about the challenges around combating resistance. I'm going to start with Dr. Bell. And I think she has a slide that should be brought up. Um, so you're our representative of the CDC here. Can you talk to us for a bit about the, all the dimensions of the global and the United States burden, public health burden of resistance? Sure. Thanks, Marin, and thanks for the invitation. Um, can you put up the first slide here? Um, I, my main message here is that antibiotic resistance is one of the most serious public health threats that are facing us uh, today. Um, in the United States, we published uh, a report in 2013 uh, that estimated that there were over 2 million people in the United States <clears throat> sickened with resistant infections every year, that 23,000 of these people died and that an additional 15,000 people uh, died each year from Clostridium difficile, which is an infection that is fueled by antibiotic use. We estimate um, over $20 billion a year in healthcare costs. And I think importantly, as Marin kind of alluded to, antibiotic resistance really threatens modern medicine, where many of the advances of the last uh, several decades could, are really severely threatened. Um, we will, you know, are facing trouble, having trouble treating people with sepsis, uh, with cancer, organ transplantation, um, all of these advances, as I say, that are really threatened by antibiotic resistance. Um, we really are, we're at a crossroads now. Um, we have to, we really need to act now um, in order to um, turn the, back the tide and, and not face uh, what uh, is really not a very pretty picture for um, a post-antibiotic era. I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes, less than a couple of minutes, um, zooming in just on a couple of these different um, bacteria, especially because Dr. Rubin, I think, is going to be talking more about one of them. And that bacteria is called CRE, which is really uh, uh, the nightmare bacteria. Um, CRE really represents sort of a triple threat. First of all, these bacteria are resistant to um, all, sometimes, or almost all of the antibiotics that are available to us. Second, um, these uh, CRE uh, infections are deadly, killing up to 50% of people that have the serious form of the infection. And thirdly, um, these CRE have the capacity to spread their, uh, their resistance gene from one class of bacteria to another. So the resistance genes are carried on these mobile elements of DNA, and um, therefore there's the um, potential 
for um, these, this resistance to spread to very common uh, sorts of bacteria that cause all sorts of common infections in the community. So for these reasons, we're especially uh, concerned about CRE. The other thing I'll say about CRE is that it's very complicated. There's many different forms of resistance. KPC is a homegrown form of resistance, which started in one state in 2001 and now is spread to all states in the country. We really have an opportunity with some of these other sort, forms of CRE to um, stop the spread um, from um, uh, where it is now, which is usually in a number of states, but not all states throughout the country. The second um, bacteria I'll just spend a couple of seconds talking about is Clostridium difficile. As I mentioned, um, this is a bacteria that is fueled by antibiotic use. So antibiotic use destroys the bacteria in the gut and allows for Clostridium difficile to overgrow. Um, this uh, infection has now become from a very rare thing, the most common healthcare-associated infection, um, causing close to 500,000 infections a year, and as I mentioned, 15,000 deaths. And unfortunately, I imagine that at least some of you know people that have had Clostridium difficile. So uh, I just, could I have the next slide, please? Um, I just uh, want to, uh, uh, could you go to the next one, please? Um, I just want to end by saying, so what do we do about it? Just very briefly, I know we'll be talking about this in more detail later. Um, as a, somebody in the federal government, I will say that over the last couple of years, probably beginning with our threat report, the U.S. government, we've all really gotten together um, to uh, work out an action plan uh, for uh, combating antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Um, and um, this action plan um, was uh, funded by Congress in 2016, and so many of us have new funding with which to address this problem. And there are really four broad areas, improving our ability to detect and track the patterns of antibiotic resistance, uh, both here and globally, and I know we'll talk about that more. Responding to outbreaks involving antibiotic-resistant bacteria, again, I think we'll be talking about that more. Preventing infections, and I'll just mention, this is really pivotal, you know, um, there are some very effective prevention strategies that we can implement now, um, and uh, we need to prevent infections by uh, better stewardship, by um, strong uh, programs in communities, because these microbes are going to continue to evolve. That's what they do. So we need to prevent infections. And finally, discovery. Um, uh, we, as I say, we do have an action plan, which we're implementing, but we're certainly not going to be uh, successful without very broad partnerships across lots of different sectors of our community. And so I, I look forward to uh, discussing this issue more with the rest of my panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Bell. So that's the picture of antibiotic resistance, sort of from the top level. But I think it's really crucial that we remember that every one of these infections happens to a patient, a patient embedded in a family, embedded in a community, a patient who often really suffers. And as a hospital epidemiologist, you've seen this up close. And I know you've had a recent superbug outbreak at UCLA that was really challenging. So can you tell us the clinician's perspective? Um, sure. Well. Thank you, first of all, uh, to the Milken Institute for uh, bringing me out. I'm happy to be on such a uh, great panel here to talk about uh, my work. So uh, at UCLA, um, you know, we deal with drug-resistant antibiotic every day. So even um, outside of specific outbreaks, uh, these are bacteria that we see on a daily basis. And most of the patients uh, who come in with these infectants tend to be patients who are transferred in uh, from other hospitals. So at a, as a you know, working at a university tertiary care hospital, we get transfers uh, from other institutions, and other institutions tend to transfer their kind of sickest patients to these university hospitals, which concentrates a lot of the sickest patients and the kind of most difficult to treat bacteria in the same place, which is, tends to be a difficult combination to, to manage. Um, so, you know, that's something we deal with as a background issue, and we have, um, whether it was MRSA or vancomycin resistant antibiotic, uh, Enterococcus, or now CRE, which is the most uh, concerning organism. It's something we've dealt with for, for decades. We probably will continue to deal with. And the way we deal with it is to try to decrease the transmission within the hospital. But um, as I said, and uh, as, as Beth was saying, you know, it's really a public health, a, a more general public health issue because uh, you know, we can't, as one specific hospital with a limited uh, population, we really can't do what we need to do on a, pop, you know, a larger population level to control the infections. 
So I'll talk a little bit about the outbreak that we identified um, because I think it, it shows the potential uh, of CRE to cause you know, rapid um, uh, infection, you know, rapid uh, strings of infection. So basically um, in October uh, of 2014, we actually identified a patient, uh, the patient was brought to our attention by an infectious disease specialist who was caring for a patient who had just undergone a procedure called ERCP or uh, you know, an endoscope that they actually um, access the gallbladder and do procedure. And it's an amazing um, procedure and it saves people uh, from having to do open surgeries like they did you know, a d decades before. Um, but it uses a scope that's very complicated, has some mechanical um, parts at the end of it and also multiple uh, working channels inside that are difficult to clean. Um, and basically what happened is we identified this one patient who had this really unusual CRE infection after um, a couple of days after um, the procedure, and that got us thinking about um, potentially ERCP being the source of an infection. And I'll spare you from all the details, but it took us some time and a lot of um, work to actually do all the molecular <coughs> testing to identify the fact that that one patient was just a single patient and, and, and it was part of an outbreak of infections at UCLA. Eventually, we identified 12 patients that had um, CRE as a result of this, you know, potentially life, uh, um, this, uh, you know, ERCP procedure, which was, you know, certainly saved some of their lives, you know, some of these patients' lives to begin with. But then we had uh, two, two deaths as a result of the, directly due to the CRE infections. And other patients ended up spending um, significant periods of time in the hospital and still, I still, um, in contact with a number of them, and they still have a lot of medical problems. So, uh, as a result of that that initial infection, what was so difficult? I mean, you, you know, infections after ERCP are not that unusual. It happens in about two percent of the patients. The problem was that the CRE organism was so resistant to antibiotics that we actually had to contact the FDA and get access to drugs that were not uh, approved, two antibiotics that were not approved in the United States. And they, um, after some delay. Um, uh, though the FDA and the, and the drug companies were really instrumental in getting, ac getting us access to these drugs, um, after some delay, um, we were able to fly in antibiotics from France and England in order to treat these infections. And so I think the delay um, as a result of you know, not having uh, adequate antibiotics really um, caused a significant problem in these patients. <coughs> Ultimately, we were able to control the infection, uh, the, the outbreak of infections by actually kind of revamping the way we um, process uh, endoscopes. But, uh, you know, I think that, that we're not the only hospital that has had this kind of outbreak. And just for endoscopes alone, we've seen in places like Chicago and, and Washington that, uh, you know, dozens of people have been sickened by these, these re drug-resistant infections. And, for instance, in Chicago, um, where they had an outbreak approximately one year before, similar outbreak approximately one year before, the, um, the organism that caused that outbreak, which was a fairly rare uh, type of CRE at the time, actually has now become an endemic organism uh, locally. So that they're seeing it all over the, you know, they're seeing it in many different hospitals, not just at that one hospital. And that's really, you know, all these outbreaks are really from usually one patient coming in um, with the organism, and then that organism being picked up by an endoscope or, you know, uh, it's not an endoscope by healthcare worker hands or the environments and being transmitted around to multiple patients. So you can see that one patient with this infection has the potential to really cause, you know, a widespread uh, outbreak and then, you know, long-term repercussions. So something that we need to deal with. Um, hospitals, you know, are, are trying to deal with it through uh, infection control and, and uh, reinforcing, you know, um, hand hygiene things like uh, surgical antibiosis and making sure that uh, patients, that those things decrease the risk of infectious patients, but, but really a broader approach that takes into account all the settings where patients come from, uh, skilled nursing facilities, long-term acute care facilities, where you know, bacteria kind of breed and, and cause trouble and transmit from patient to patient, and then come into tertiary care centers where they're able to transmit more broadly is, um, is really important. So I think you know, even though I'm talking about a specific in, uh, outbreak at UCLA, it really, it really spanned the globe because the initial patient we had eventually discovered came from, brought the organism with them from India. And, uh, mm. and so came from India, you know, and then came into our institution and spread to multiple patients. So it's a, it's a huge global problem with local effects. So let's table for a moment 
the question of surveillance and how you identify those patients as they come in. So I really want to, um, to pick up on something you said about how extraordinarily difficult it was to treat these people, that the, the, the infections did not respond to a drug and did not respond to a drug, and eventually you had to get an investigational drug. So all the way over here, Dr. Eisenstein um, of Merck, why are we in that situation? Why, are there, why have the drugs, the bugs leapfrogged in front of the drugs like this, and, and why have we run out of good new drugs? Well, thank you for um, including me on the panel. I would uh, like to start off, before I answer that question, to tell you in part why I personally am in this game. And that is that uh, my wife and I were delighted to have a granddaughter born to us, uh, to our daughter, I should say. Uh, nine years ago, she unfortunately had a very serious congenital disease that's caused lots of different medical problems, but included in that were... Uh, no fewer than 10 complicated urinary tract infections by the time she was two years old, each one requiring a progressively more powerful drug. By the time she got her 10th infection, barely at the age of two, it wasn't quite a CRE, thank God. It was the ESBL, the, the, the type of infection resistance just below that, and she was able to be treated effectively with uh, a carbapenem, which interestingly enough, Merck uh, back in the 1980s was the first to develop and then uh, license. So she was saved and then, and then subsequently received a urologic procedure that enabled those infections not to be an issue anymore. But we, we feel this very, uh, very personally. Now in terms of resistance and why it develops, in a way my granddaughter reflects the story. Uh, Interaction with antibiotics selects more resistance. They persist because of the microbiome. We're going to be hearing more about that in a moment. They get to spread around. She's a frequent flyer in the hospital. She picks up organisms that others have, even in the very best hospitals. You can't quite prevent that sort of spread, as we already heard at a great institution like UCLA. And finally, because bacteria grow every 20 minutes, under best circumstances, and there are perhaps as many as 10 times the number of bacterial cells in our body as human cells in our body do the math. And you recognize using uh, the modern concepts of genetics and selection that you're going to be able to select for resistance. The trouble is that um, as Joshua, the late Nobel laureate Joshua Lederberg famously said, uh, it's our wits against their genes, we have to be smarter. Well, how can we be smarter? We've essentially, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry, plucked most of the easy to develop antimicrobials, starting with the sulfa drugs, then the penicillins, et cetera. Much of that has been done over from 70 years ago to about 50 years ago, or 20 years ago. The last 20 years, we've pretty much run out of new chemical entities. Adding to the problem is the fact that innovators are not particularly rewarded in the anti-infective space. You're dealing with, if you think about it, a confluence of terrible aspects resulting in market failure. It's acute disease, so you don't get somebody on the drug. I mean, I take a statin, I take a low-dose antihypertensive drug, I'm going to do it for the rest of my life, as many people my age do. Okay, think about that from a return on investment. Antibiotic, fortunately I haven't needed one, my granddaughter did, but fortunately she only needed it for two weeks. Think about the difference, lifelong versus two weeks. The other problem is that we now have accumulated a fair number of generic antimicrobials. Many of them are still very effective because although we are very worried about the resistant ones, the majority of organisms are still susceptible to the antibiotics that we presently have. Generics have gotten very cheap. You can go to Walmarts or Costco in some cases with a prescription and get either free antibiotic or near free antimicrobial. Think of that. And think of what that means in terms of essentially what society, quote, values, puts the value on the antimicrobials. Okay, then I worked at Cubist Pharmaceuticals for 12 years before we were acquired by Merck a year ago. And 
at Cubist, we realized that we, we had to develop highly potent antibiotics. We came out with a drug daptomycin that's still being used for MRSA. What's the problem? Problem with the new drug like daptomycin is it's put on the shelf because what the physician wants to do, even though that may be a better drug, it's going to want to use the old generic drug at quite a bit less expense. So you have this paradox of coming up with what we were able to show is actually a better drug, but it's not used. It's put on the shelf for the super emergency, for the patient who's failed several times. You put all that together, the return on investment for an antimicrobial is less than one-tenth the return on investment for a hypertensive, well, for a cancer drug, for a depression drug, et cetera. For that reason, over the last 20 years, many, many of the big companies have pulled out of the business. I'm fortunate to be working at Merck, which has had a long-term commitment to anti-infective discovery and development. Not only were they the first for the carbapenems, but in the 1930s, they were among the first with the sulfa drugs. And they're also a leader in vaccines. And we should also talk about the aspects, in addition to treatment, there's prevention. And vaccines really need to be at the front of that. And also antimicrobial stewardship. And with leadership that started at Cubist, moving into Merck, Merck embraced the notion. Antimicrobial stewardship means the right drug for the right patient, the right time for the right duration with the right diagnosis. And that's the last point that I'd like to make. And until we get better at diagnosis, we're going to continue to use about 70% of our antimicrobials inappropriately. Why? We're treating individuals who don't even have bacterial infections. Many of them are viral infections. Think about what it would be if we could have a rapid test based on probably biomarkers, and people are working on this now, that will tell you within 20 minutes of your appearing in the physician's office, you've got a viral infection. You don't need to be on an antibody. If you do have a bacterial infection and you're pretty sick, then we would know within an hour or so what the bug is and what the susceptibility is. And therefore, if we need to save the really potent drug, let's not use it even if you're really sick because you don't need to use it. And what will that do? It will markedly decrease the pressure of selection on resistance. And it's the combination of the newer drugs and the diagnostics that we think can be synergistic. What's the issue here? It gets back again to return on investment. I was at the White House panel several months ago on antimicrobial stewardship, and sitting next to me was the CEO of a diagnostics company. He said publicly, he said to me privately and then publicly, there's not enough interest in developing these sort of diagnostics for widespread use because we're not being reimbursed. Think about that from a public health standpoint. So I'll rest my case there. I hope we can come back to, to the incentives that would be necessary to get both mm. drug and device makers back into the game. Mm. But the one thing that I want to be sure that we talk about before we go on to that is that everything we've said so far really has to do with the practice of medicine. But as Lederberg said, we live in a microbial world, and uh, there are other influences on what's going on in that bacterial traffic than just what's going on in medicine. And Dr. Price, your research has been elucidating that. So can you talk a bit about the other influences on the emergence of resistance and, and how difficult it is to, to track that bacterial traffic back and forth? Sure. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think it's important uh, to, to point out that, well, we have to think about these bacteria and from an ecological perspective. We have to understand the ecology of these bacteria from the scale of the globe to the scale of the microbial interactions in our gut. So we're talking about 17 orders of magnitude of spatial uh, ecology. And, and, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to do in the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center is to understand that ecology at that scale. But really, this comes down to two things. It comes down to antibiotic use and the spread of bacteria or transmission of bacteria. So with respect to antibiotic use, we've talked a lot about antibiotic use in human medicine. We also have to think about antibiotic use in animal production. So this is true for the developing countries and the developed countries. We, we use a lot of antibiotics in food animal production. It, they've become, it's become integral. I don't want to say integral because I don't think they're actually necessary, but they've become part of the formula 
for industrial livestock production where you have thousands of animals crammed together and you give them antibiotics to prevent diseases that are occurring because of the crowded, stressful, unsanitary conditions, but also they're using antibiotics to make them grow faster for pure economic decisions, you know, to make them use their feed more efficiently to make lean muscle mass for us to eat. And unfortunately, you know, in the United States, we're using about 34 million pounds of antibiotics for food animal production. We use about 8 million pounds in human medicine. So on one side, everybody's saying this is too much in human medicine, and we're sort of ignoring this, this you know, literally this more than the size of an elephant in the room, uh, 34 million pounds. And sadly, the developing world, so the BRICS nations, right, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, are adopting the Western meat-centric diet, but they're also adopting our Western American-style industrial animal production, which includes all of these antibiotics. And we had a big slap in the face in November, and Marin has written about this uh, eloquently. Um, in China, they were using our last drug for treating CRE. We talked about this, this horrible outbreak of CRE, this, this pandemic now of CRE. One of the last drugs that we have to treat a lot of these strains is something called colistin. Turns out that China was using our model of production, and they were using colistin in their animals to make them grow faster to, to prevent diseases. And that's where we saw the evolution of a new mobile element. So uh, Dr. Bell spoke about these mobile elements, a new mobile element that codes for resistance to colistin. We've already seen that jump from these, from these animals into people in China. We've already seen it jump into CRE strains now, and we've seen it in more than 20 countries. So this is just a big slap in the face, reminding us that we have to take care of this. With respect to the spread of bacteria, this comes to this, right? So with globalization, people are moving around more quickly than ever, but bacteria are hitchhiking with us, right? So they ride with us on the airplanes. They ride on our hands and our guts, and we're carrying them around the world. But they also hitchhike on meat. Right, as that's being traded regionally and internationally. And we're facing a time when we could have untreatable bacteria in the food supply. I mean, I, I think we really have to take a pause and step back from that and think about that. But in the develop, we, this is a problem. The transmission of bacteria is a problem that we have to tackle in the developing world and the developed world. In the developing world, we have to focus on clean water. That solves a lot of problems, right? But clean, uh, dirty water can transmit drug-resistant bacteria. We have to provide clean water. We have to reduce the barriers to hygiene, so get, get, make it easy for people to wash their hands, right? In the, developing, in the developed world, we need to think about vaccines, but one of the things that we're working on in our group is probiotic approaches. Can we use the good bacteria to stop the bad bacteria from spreading? Because we do want to prevent the infections, not just think about treating them. But wouldn't it be better to keep people from getting sick? And it turns out that not all bacteria get along, and so we're trying to use good bacteria to stop those bad bacteria. So finally, I just want to say that in our group, I think we take it a step further, which is to, to really think about how do we communicate these findings more clearly to the general public. They, after all, have, you know, we all have something at stake here. I mean, the, the protecting antibiotics for future generations. And people, it's the general public who essentially pays for our research. And so we really try to help people uh, the general public understand this, but the other people that we really want to understand this are policymakers, because they have a role to play in protecting antibiotics for future generations, and we want science-based policy. And, and with that, I just want to finish by just saying that I, I really value you, Marin, because th there's nobody that communicates this as clearly as you, and so I, you know, I just really appreciate your writing and your communication of this important issue. You brought it up to a new level. Thank you. So. <laughs> I am, I'm very flattered by the compliment. It's obviously taken my breath away. Um, <laughs> Here's some water. A, a rapid pivot back to work subject. Um, so you mentioned MCR, this, this uh, organism that, the gene that resides in gut organisms that has, um, from its announcement, not identification last November, uh, as being present in China for a couple of years, has been found all across the world. Dr. Rubin mentioned that the, the index patient in his outbreak was someone from India. That was also the case when NDM was identified in Sweden in 2008, that it was someone who had been in a hospital in New Delhi. And um, just this, and NDM is um, in a, some crazy high percentage of water, surface water sources in India and Pakistan. 
last week um, it was announced that MCR is present in chickens in Tunisia that were bought in France and imported. Mm. So, so what do we do to to detect this bacterial traffic? Do you have any uh, any ideas about that invisible spread? Yeah. So, so one of the big challenges with the bacteria that we're talking about, CRE. Somebody named it the Phantom Menace, I think. You know, and so part of the reason they call it the Phantom Menace is because we can carry it without symptoms, right? We can have it in our guts. You can't put up fever monitors, you know, that's not gonna help you here because most of the time you're not showing symptoms. It's when these are called opportunistic diseases or pathogens. So it's only when that E. coli gets from the gastrointestinal tract into the urinary tract or the Klebsiella gets from one to the other that you have a problem. And so these things can be passed from food to people, from animals to people, from people to people. And so parsing that apart, trying to understand the ecology takes some really refined tools and so what we've been doing is using whole genome sequencing. So let me, let me take you back, what was it, 10 years ago when the anthrax letters were mailed, and we wanted to try to find the source of those. So what did they do? They collected the anthrax spores and then all the people who had anthrax before, and they sequenced those genomes. Each genome costs a half a million dollars to sequence. Today we can do it for $50. So we are doing, now to understand this, so the thing that we're interested in is foodborne transmission of E. coli causing urinary tract infections. We call these foodies, they're foodborne urinary tract infections. So what are we doing? We're using whole genome sequencing to differentiate, to sequence thousands of E. coli genomes from food, from people, from the, from the hospital, from the community, and we're trying to figure out what is the population overlap between that that we see in the food and that that we see infecting people. And we're starting to really see this, that we're being able to pull this apart and understand this traffic. And that's, those are really the tools that we need to do this. So, Dr. Eisenstein, you mentioned the lack of incentive for drug and device manufacturers to really innovate in this space. Do you see a role or, or a, a concept for essentially the you know, rapid bedside diagnostics that would do the kind of detection that Dr. Price is talking about? The hope is the technology, well, the, the technology is there mm -hmm. for both ruling in or out bacterial infections and rapid diagnostics of the specific organism and the susceptibility. The problem is making it available in a way that enables a change in the public health. And the issue here is uh, the cost uh, versus the reimbursement. And part of the issue with antimicrobials as well relates to reimbursement issues. Uh, just to make a comment about what's previously done and how things can actually change, the GAIN Act was passed a couple of years ago. I actually had some minor influence in um, testifying before Congress several times. The GAIN Act uh, as, um, was beneficial for antimicrobials in the following way. It, it did both help on both the regulatory side and also on the economic side. And the, this is where you can actually see some leverage. On the regulatory side, it designated new products that were designed to go against highly important resistant life-threatening organisms as designated by the FDA, both priority review and fast track, which meant that the FDA would move these applications through quite a bit faster. That's a big, that's a big deal because every month or two or three that you save before being able to launch the drug, you obviously are able to get a better return. The second is the economic aspect. The typical new drug gets a, a, a five-year window based on the old Hatch-Waxman Act from a number of years ago, five-year exclusivity. What GAIN did was add another five years at the back end. So essentially now you have a total of 10 years of market exclusivity. So these are very helpful and we've seen actually a resurgence of some interest. Is that enough? Probably not. It doesn't help the diagnostics. And on the side of what goes on in hospitals, we still have what is known as these bundled DRG payments. So a hospital gets paid X amount, and it doesn't matter how expensive the antibiotic happens to be if they use the modern antibiotic that costs more because it's going against the generic. The hospital doesn't get reimbursed anymore. One of the bills that's being considered at Congress right now is to decouple 
the DRG payment from the specific payment for the antimicrobial. And to further that, there's a lot of effort, certainly by Cubis, certainly by Merck, other companies I think are putting effort into this, to demonstrate that there's true value. There's society gets something in return for the extra expense to pay for the new drug. So as an example of that, daptomycin I mentioned earlier, a drug I was extensively involved in developing, we were able to demonstrate that compared with vancomycin, which is a generic drug that essentially costs very little, that patients with significant serious uh, skin infections that needed to be hospitalized could be discharged from the hospital on average of two to three days earlier on daptomycin compared with vancomycin. And the economic analysis demonstrated that even if you gave away vancomycin for free, it would still be the more expensive drug. So if we start to get decoupling, value-based pricing, more recognition of what the true value is, and somehow figure out how to incent the diagnostic side, which I haven't been involved enough to know, but I think would be terrific if we could do that, you start to see a real change. And, and I think you can move the ball significantly. So what, what does that sort of vision look like from the point of view of a clinician? What do you need to, to keep someone like that index patient that you had in your outbreak from being detected in time to spread something through the hospital? Um, it's a good question. Uh, something that I've been kind of thinking about a lot uh, lately. You know, I, I, I can imagine that, um, you know, getting off the plane from India or China and someone came up to you and said, welcome to America, have your rectal swab would probably not be the most uh, appreciated kind of uh, introduction to the, to the United States. So, so I think detecting these things, you know, in, in transit is really pretty impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, because but they did that in France when NDM started to move. They did that um, at hospital admission, right? They actually did in <clears throat> institute um, rectal screening to detect you, that bug. So you can. <laughs> yeah, so you can do that, and we do that in, in certain populations as well. Um, you know, throughout American hospitals. So and the CDC has um, kind of put it, put forward recommendations about how to how to screen for CRE. So we do that um, in in the hospital populations. Uh, but I, I think even taking a step back, you know, before we detect that, you know, there are, we're talking about organisms that um, you know, are, are, are clonal and are transmitted from place to place, but there are a lot of, you know, much more common are the organisms like ESBL that was mentioned or MRSA or vincomycin or VRE, organisms that um, are endemic now to the U.S. Um, we could do a better job of, of screening for those on hospital admission and actually doing something about that. Um, but I think... You know, one of the problems is, you know, what do you what do you do with what do you do with that afterwards, and how do you prevent or or even before that, how do you prevent those infections from happening? Because I think, you know, from a number of outbreaks, ours included, but there were other outbreaks. This one in Germany, where they looked at long term carriage of these resistant organisms, and what they found was that the vast majority of people who had these resistant Klebsiella bacteria in their colons actually cleared them um, at, within six months. Uh, the patients that didn't tended to be the patients that were exposed, re-exposed to antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think antibiotic pressure is really an important, an important issue. Um, and then even if someone may have the Klebsiella in their colon, if you're not treating them with antibiotics, they may not really become uh, a concern at all. And so I think antibiotic stewardship is really, really crucial. So we heard about, you know, in, in animals, which, you know, I have absolutely no control over, but uh, in patients, we do, and we can limit uh, the unnecessary antibiotics. There was actually just a study that came out in the last, uh, last month or so um, looking at, at uh, patients in the ICU. And what it found was that you know, most, the, about 60% of patients who get started on antibiotics get continued on them despite the fact that um, cultures are negative and there's really not great evidence that there's an active infection. So I think that people, clinicians, I think fear um, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, certainly, but I think they, they fear missing, you know, un, not treating patients that have active infections and missing the window of opportunity um, to treat those patients. And so there's this kind of, you know, which are you more scared of? Well, the patient in front of me is the patient in front of me. And so, you know, if I'm concerned about bacteria, uh, or about potential infection, I'm going to go ahead and treat that, that patient with, uh, you know, the antibiotics I feel like they need to get. And I, I think less about kind of the population effects, which is why, 
Hospitals now have antibiotic stewardship programs to kind of keep people on it. But do you, do you ever look ahead and get frightened? Do you, do you think the practice of medicine as I know it is going to go away if we don't get this under control? Well, I, I definitely. And there was actually um, a study uh, approximately a year ago that looked at kind of modeling um, some of the impacts of resistant bacteria. And the thing that kind of struck me, which I hadn't really thought of before, is that, you know, if, you know, patients um, are treated for, are, are prophylaxed for infections prior to surgery. And, you know, now that's brought our infection rates down after surgery to well uh, lower than 1%. If you look at places where they don't prophylax, like uh, some of the best hospitals in Ethiopia that I know about, um, you know, there's about one third of patients going in for routine surgery will end up with a post-operative infection. And that's because they don't get, you know, the right antimicrobials at the right times. So think about what would happen if, if the typical antibiotics that we use to prophylax patients now just aren't working. And that's kind of what happened with our ERCP outbreak is that, you know, the, the drugs that we use for prophylaxis just don't treat CRE. And so then you've got, you know, a, you, know you get these resistant bacteria developing. And, and I think that's an impact that, you know, people going in for, you know, not, not the patients that have been in the hospital for a month already on multiple antibiotics that we know are at risk for CRE, but the patients who, come in for a simple ankle surgery or, or you know, a hernia surgery or something like that, then you know, what happens to them when the, the antimicrobial prophylaxis no longer works? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that going forward, that's going to have a huge impact, not only just patients that are in the hospital and are sick now, but patients you know, who are relatively healthy and coming in for routine procedures. So I think it has a potential huge impact later. Dr. Bell, <clears throat> when I listen to all these uh, discussions, the thing that strikes me time and time again is how granular the fight against antibiotic resistance has to be, that it's made up of so many individual decisions from something as large as um, how a country decides to raise its animals to, um, to whether an individual physician late at night is going to order a particular antibiotic because he's worried about a particular patient, or even if someone, you know, just an, an average mom waking up in the morning needs to get to work and her kid is sick and she demands an antibiotic, whether, <clears throat> she re whether the child really needs it or not, because she doesn't have sick leave. When you think of how, from the CDC's perspective, when you think of how complex and multifactorial this is, do, do you see any solutions? Is there, is there any way sort of just saying we, we rely on everyone's um, best personal responsibility to, to guide this issue in the direction we need it to go? Well, you know, it clearly is a very, very big problem. It's scary. It's scary, you know, for me with my gray hair, having worked at the CDC for over 20 years. But I, I think that what we really need to do is use this as a call to action. And I think, as you've said and Lance has pointed out also, this is multifactorial. It's very complicated. But I think the other way around to look at this is that means that everyone has a role to play in solving the problem. And, and I think that we can break it down into its component parts um, and, um, and then focus on um, doing everything we can in each of those areas. So for example, I think to Zach's point that antibiotic resistance is a community problem. It's not an individual facility problem. And this is one of the reasons why um, we now, with the Antibiotic Solutions Initiative at CDC, are um, promoting what we call an integrated approach, a community-based integrative approach to um, fighting antibiotic resistance. So this means facilities within a community um, communicating with each other so that facilities know when patients are being transferred from place to place, that there's a central registry so that we know when there are patients, for example, that are colonized with resistant bacteria and that are moving from one place to another. There are strategies that can be employed when you know that there's a patient with resistant bacteria that's coming to your facility. And there is a, some, a number of good demonstration projects that show that we can drive down transmission of resistant bacteria in facilities when we look at this from a holistic and coordinated approach. So that's one thing. The issue of stewardship is an enormous question. We've all pointed out how in many different ways antibiotic use, overuse, drives resistance, and that we need to be striving for the right drug at the right dose in the right duration for the um, right indication. And this is a situation where, as I think that um, 
the uh, stewardship programs are a really important component. We need um, lots of different levers, everywhere from CMS and reimbursement to help hospitals uh, to do the right thing, all the way to uh, patients. And I think that uh, changing social norms is a really important part of this, so that when someone goes to the doctor, instead of saying, give me my antibiotic, they say, wait a minute, why are you giving me an antibiotic? Do I really need this? I don't want to get clostridium difficile. And this is obviously um, you know, something that doesn't come um, quickly, but I think we do have good examples of where we have been able to change social norms and that that helps to drive policy. The other thing I guess I would say about all of this is that especially because this is so complicated, we need better information to drive our prevention strategies. And um, that is better information about who's getting what infection, and it's also better information about how antibiotics are being used. And these are also two areas that we've been focusing on at the CDC. So from the perspective of better information, um, you know, right now we're really not where we need to be in that regard. Um, we don't have, most um, health departments don't have the ability to identify the mechanism of resistance, which, you know, as you've heard about these um, CREs that have these mobile gene elements, we really need to know about that. And a doctor for a clinical diagnosis doesn't need to know that. So we don't have the capability right now that we need to be able to track the really bad bacteria the way we need to. And so with the Antibiotic um, Solutions Initiative, we are going to be um, improving health departments' capabilities to identify um, uh, these uh, particularly dangerous resistant bacteria and also to identify colonization, which is important. We'll be setting up a regional laboratory network around the country um, where um, these isolates can be collected. We can uh, do the kind of molecular epidemiology that Lance is talking about so that we can track where they're being spread around the country. And we, once again, can target interventions to communities where we see that some of these particularly uh, troublesome bacteria are circulating. And in the area of antibiotic use, and this I think is really important, we, we don't uh, understand how antibiotics are being used the way we need to in order for facilities to have the kind of policies that they need and provide feedback to clinicians, uh, which can improve practice and also at a state level in outpatient facilities. And so um, this is another area where we're really focusing a lot of attention so that we can um, have a way for hospitals and doctors to have the sort of continuous quality improvement that is necessary in order to um, improve use. And then the last thing I guess I'll say um, to this point about um, uh, antibiotic resistance being a global problem. You know, I, I just got back from India, actually, on Sunday uh, night, and I think that, you know, people's um, descriptions here of how large a problem antibiotic resistance is in India, both in terms of um, it, resistance in um, people, in facilities, and also in terms of the volume of antibiotics that are used in agriculture. You know, this is a, these are countries where, um, you know, this antibiotic colistin that you were talking about, Lance, um, this is an antibiotic that, you know, we reserve for extremely rare circumstances. Yet colistin is being used in facilities in India um, fairly frequently because so many patients are presenting mm. with infections that are not sensitive to any other antibiotic. Um, but, um, you know, one of the major problems that uh, they have in India and many other countries is that they don't actually have the capability to culture and track these organisms. So this is an area that we've been working on um, actually as a global community through the global health security agenda um, where um, uh, countries have come together around the world to focus on improving um, countries' ability to detect, uh, prevent, and respond to infectious diseases um, with Ebola actually being the poster child of what happens when we don't have those capabilities. So antibiotic resistance is one area that's being addressed in the global health security agenda. And one of the things that we're working on in India and a number of other countries is, improve, is, is improving laboratory capacity in some very, very basic and fundamental ways so that um, facilities, so that countries can start to, to better target uh, where they need to focus their attention in order to sort of turn the tide. <laughs> we could go on. Um, <laughs> this is such a rich topic. But I think that that uh, hope 
for global data sharing and global action is a good place to, to stop because this is in the end uh, a global problem no matter how many individual decisions it's made up out of. Will you please join me in thanking the panelists for a fascinating discussion? Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming.